broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, all right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I I, I hope you can uh, hear me and see my uh, slide all right. My name's Kevin Stokesbury, and I'm going to be uh, uh, presenting today. Uh, my host uh, was, uh, was was Taryn Picard, and unfortunately, just before uh, we went live here, uh, I think there was a thunderstorm on the Cape, and and she lost contact. So uh, I <laughs> so so I'm introducing myself, um, and uh, right, but uh, here's here's a little information on on uh, uh, Taryn, and then. Um, some webinar details. Uh, hopefully, I'll I'll speak for about forty five minutes. Uh, although I do get excited about this topic and can go on, but I'll try not to. Um, and then we'll have about fifteen minutes for for questions afterwards. And the webinar is uh, recorded, and there'll be a follow up uh, email. Uh, it, also, it's um, hosted by Onset, which is. Uh, Home of the Hobo Data uh, Loggers, which uh, is over on Cape Cod, and um, we've used this gear for 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 a long time, and uh, and so I I hope to talk a little bit about about that with uh, with our work, and um, a little bit about myself. I'm Kevin Stokesbury. I'm a professor here at the uh, Department of Fisheries Oceanography in um, uh, the School for Marine Science and Technology at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth. So our campus is over here in New Bedford. Uh, I do a lot of research on uh, marine ecology, particularly in vertebrates and fish, and their spatial distribution and their population dynamics, trying to understand um, where they are and why they're there and what impacts them, both uh, from the environment and from uh, development. So. Uh, I guess we will just jump in, uh, and I'm hoping uh, that everything is uh, is a go, and that everyone can hear me all right. Um, if you can't, maybe someone could just send me a quick uh, chat or something, just saying everything's okay, just so I'm sure uh, I'm sure it's all right. Um, just so you know, everyone says that I've received a message; they can hear you fine. So you oh, can... wonderful. Yes. Wonderful. All righty. Um, great. So I'll jump in. Uh, I'd like to talk to you today about a framework for categorizing the interaction between uh, the offshore wind farm industry and the fisheries here in New England. Uh, my co-author is David Bethany, uh, who's also, uh, uh, he was my former uh, uh, a PhD student, and uh, we've done a lot of this work together. So just to set the stage, um, <clears throat> the, the offshore wind industry is developing rapidly. This is, uh, this is the global offshore wind report for 2001, and what you see here is the amount of development uh, for each of the, the countries around the world that has, or continents around the world, I should say, uh, that started um, in 2020, where they hope to be by 2030, and then the target, uh, according to the, the the Paris Accord, for 2050, and then what you'd actually have to do to make it uh, carbon neutral to be to be really relying completely on uh, uh, offshore wind as an alternative energy. So we're just beginning a, a huge development worldwide. In Europe, this has been going on for a while, and the average increase has been roughly 20, 22 uh, percent. So, for the from 2020 to 2030, you can see that these uh, different countries are, are uh, you know, have a fairly gradated development. Um, that's also led to a fair bit of work, uh, both in simulation and also uh, analysis of the different types of impact on on fisheries and different kind of projection models. And they've been they've been developing this and working at it for, for a while. Compare that to the uh, situation in North America here, where we are really going to to go full throttle at it in the next uh, 
few years, we're going to go kind of from zero to 100. So we're, it's an actual an increase of, of 79%. It's been uh, an amazing uh, situation to see this develop. The first uh, lease area, which is way up here in the corner, Vineyard Wind, which is just going to start construction in a few weeks, uh, that was leased for about $250,000. Whereas these areas off, uh, and that was what, I think maybe 10 years ago, these, these areas off of New York here, there was just a bid on an auction for them in, in uh, January, last January, and they went for $4.3 billion. So huge amount of money going for these lease areas uh, up on the, the lottery or the auction, I guess it would be. And the Department of Energy has predicted that there's gonna be a, huge, uh, a large increase in jobs and it's going to um, cut down a lot of carbon emissions and, um, and also uh, create a pathway for the further development to 2050. So that's all, all very positive and, and, and good news, but at the same time, we have to remember that there's also a very active commercial fishery on our continental shelf. And the fisheries in, uh, of New England are very important and, and uh, for the whole country. Um, bringing in a value of about 5.5 billion. Just in New Bedford here alone, it's about $450 million uh, a year, uh, over 35,000 jobs just in, in, in New Bedford. And also the consumption of uh, fish is going up. It is a, a natural wild caught uh, protein, uh, unadulterated. And so the health benefits and, and the interest in it are, are, very, um, are very important. Uh, in New England, uh, the Atlantic sea scallop fishery is one of the two major ones, the, the Atlantic sea scallop and also the lobster fishery. Each are worth roughly a half a billion per year. Last year, the scallop landings was $669 million, so a little, little higher than this average. But for the last 20 years, both these fisheries have been extremely sustainable, above maximum sustainable yield and been very uh, lucrative and productive. And we're gonna use, I, I, a lot of my work has been on examining the scallop fishery and the scallop stock and working with the fishermen to try and assess this. So what we're going to do is use this as a little bit of a, a mock-up to look at the comparison between this industry and the um, developing wind farms. So what I found, I started working uh, on this in about uh, 2011. And uh, before that, I had been involved in, in the ramifications of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. And so I, and, and also the um, environmental impact of the first uh, 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 marine tur turbine, um, tidal power turbine up in Annapolis Royal in, in Nova Scotia. So I've been working on environmental impacts of these type of things for a while. And, uh, and I was finding that, that, that the discussions going on uh, between the fishing industry and, and the wind farm industry, they really seem to be talking uh, in different almost languages and in different ways. So I was trying to come up with a framework that would help uh, compare and contrast these industries and at least put them on the same playing field as far as data. So uh, the first thing to address is, is scale. And in, there's a, a classic book by uh, Ernest Mayer, who's a fantastic scientist from Harvard. And um, he talks about the questions in ecology and he links them all uh, to scale. And I kind of uh, use that idea, but uh, putting it on, on offshore wind and on fisheries. So here, you're gonna have three kind of scales, the scale of the centimeter to the kilometer, which would be a single turbine or a vessel from one kilometer squared to a thousand kilometers squared, which would be uh, a company, either a, a wind farm company or a fishing company that kind of uh, uh, the, the fleet somewhat fishes together. And then greater than a thousand kilometers squared, which is a really a regional impact. So the entire fleet or uh, a number of wind farm companies um, uh, uh, making up the region. And you also have to think about it on the temporal scale. So uh, what we've recommended was three years pre-construction, uh, then uh, a, a phase where you're looking at it during construction, because that's gonna be a very um, 
So the pre-construction would set up your, your kind of baseline. The uh, during construction is uh, it's kind of a unique um, type of environmental disturbance. Then operation, which would run for 20 to 40 years, and finally uh, decommission, uh, assuming these are decommissioned. So uh, you had to keep those two scales in mind. But then how do you ad address the information that is uh, coming at you uh, and, and putting it in the context of those different scales? So I, I looked at some of the um, work that has been done particularly in fisheries and the, uh, the, the Canadian government sponsored a center of excellence on looking at fisheries management and they really divided, um, divided their analysis up into four objectives that they were calling pillars of sustainability. And those are ecological, economic, social, and institutional. And in the US, our fisheries are managed under the Magnuson-Stevenson Act. And it, within the Magnuson-Stevenson Act, there are uh, 10 national standards. And you can actually divide and group these standards up and they fit fairly well within these pillars of sustainability. And so that's what I did. And I, I, I looked at, um, for ecological, you have the scientific information and the idea that, that, that this is gonna be a, you know, a huge change, the, the, the development uh, of this offshore environment, and it's going to affect a number of different habitats and communities. It's going to affect the benthic community because you're changing the type of substrate, the pelagic uh, community because you'll be affecting the, the water currents, the acoustic uh, because you'll be introducing uh, different types of noise uh, and vibration into the water, and the electromagnetic because you're sending strong currents over these uh, cables and creating uh, electromagnetic fields. Then also, I, I, and this is, uh, that's the areas where I focus the most, but uh, there's also a whole series of um, interactions on the economic level, on the social level, and also the institutional level. So I took the national standards, uh, used the questions that each address, and, and put it into those four categories of, sustain, um, of, of, of sustainability. So to to break it down into a table on the first scale. If you look at each of those, or if you overlay those on the different scales. So if we look at the scale of the individual turbine or the fishing industry, you can go through and you can start to categorize what, what is known. Like I, I, in this example, there's a number of uh, good papers that were recently published in, in the process, um, proceedings of oceanography. Uh, on wind farm, there's also fairly extensive work on the effects of a single fishing veg vessel on a scallop dredge um, and its impacts on the seafloor because the fisheries certainly affect the environment as well. Uh, then you can you can start to try and uh, quantify the different um, the different levels of, of of disturbance with these uh, different questions. So here you have the single vessel and now, you have to think of these vessels as, as a, 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 each one, there, there are 350 vessels in our fleet and each one is, is kind of a small uh, company. There would be, right now there's a seven person crew uh, limit on these vessels. So you're looking at seven families plus all the support uh, industries that go along with it. So, so each one is a small business, um, they, they tow two, uh, 15 foot dredges and um, and the, 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 as I was saying, they're making a very good living, but it's dangerous work. You're in all kinds of different conditions uh, and you, you have a, a lot to contend with. And of course, one of the things that, that they use uh, a great deal is radar. And with uh, radar, if you look at what the Coast Guard has approved for the spacing of wind turbines, you are looking at uh, one nautical mile apart on a north, south, east, west grid. So it's going to make navigation very challenging. Most vessels that I've been on, they set their navigation at about uh, six nautical miles, which is what this one shows. Here you have the yellow dots are, are lobster pots. Uh, you can, the blue lines, the track of the vessel. There's also another vessel up in the corner. And then 
if you add overlay what the wind farm field will look like, there'll be 120 targets within that. And that is uh, a National Academy of Science study just came out and showed that there was going to be shadowing problems and also inclement weather. This will this will make navigation quite difficult. And remember, each one of these turbines will be uh, the size roughly of the Sears Tower. They're, they're, they're very large. So there's a, a, you know issues about safety, about navigation, about how uh, the fishery will be managed through those. And then um, there's also the ecological uh, impacts. In, in this example, this is about biofouling. And there was a recent study looking at uh, all the natural um, or all the, 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 the mad main docks and such around the world and how much biofouling goes on and how much uh, CO2 um, is, uh, is produced, uh, uh, how much uh, primary productivity, uh, basically the, the equation they came up with was for every one square, uh, I think it is square meter, uh, 130 uh, square meters of primary pro uh, productivity is removed from the water. So there is a there is a reefing effect, and I think that's one of the the key things to remember from a from a biological point of view is that this is a huge experiment in island biogeography. You're going to be introducing a hard substrat uh, to a, and also an intertidal and sub subtidal zone to an area that is uh, otherwise an offshore ocean environment with a very soft uh, homogeneous substrate. If we look at the next scale, which is on what I call the population, so one kilometer to a thousand kilometers. So this would be a wind farm company, something like uh, Vineyard Wind or Orsted, uh, or their particular de developments. Right now, there are 19 develops, developments along the coast. And then uh, the fishing company. Now, for, for environmental impact, this is the scale on which the most research has been done. And that's because the, each of these companies is required to come up with an environmental impact plan uh, under the NEPA uh, law. And so uh, this is an example of Vineyard Winds, uh, which we worked on with them. Uh, and we proposed a series of uh, different seasonal surveys, benthic trawl, uh, trap, and also plankton surveys, plus a number of uh, supplemental surveys. So. These, uh, this industry, anyway, this uh, the, the Vineyard Wind has been uh, conducting uh, these. And my colleague here at SMS, uh, Dr. Pingo Hu, he and his laboratory have been doing a series of, of ground fish toes. Now, each one of these three surveys that I'm going to present to you here uh, briefly are, are basically extensions or designs that, that fit in with larger scale surveys. For example, this, this, um, this trawl survey is designed after the NEPA survey, which was conducted by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science. And they survey the uh, strata in between where the Marine Fishery Service can survey and the near shore uh, because it's too shallow for the Marine Fishery Service boat to go. So that survey was designed on a commercial vessel. This is an extension of that using the same protocol and, and that uh, NEPA survey has been correlated with the Marine Fishery Survey. So basically, there's a, an, an effort to, to calibrate and coordinate the different uh, surveys. So uh, Chris and, and Pingo, Chris Rulahan and Pingo, he are, are conducting uh, these and have done a, a great job at starting to look at both the impact area and the control area. This is some of my work uh, that I was uh, uh, telling you uh, uh, briefly about. This is the drop camera survey where, and we use it to look at scallop abundance, but also it really is a macrobenthic um, invertebrate survey. And this one, we count about 50 different invertebrates and identify the substrate as well. It's a quadrat photographic um, survey. We, we have uh, uh, three cameras and a series of lights what we're shooting for is a, is a clear shot of the sea floor on which we can identify uh, the, the animals. And uh, it's all geo-referenced. We actually, for each dot, and this is on a 1.5 nautical mile uh, basis here, we do four drops uh, because uh, based on, uh, it's based on scallops and, and what would be commercially 
fishable for scallops. So, but in doing that, we also, this is one of the areas where we make a, a great use of the, the, the hobos and, and, the, and the tidbit. Um, here's a shot of our camera. And you can see right here, mounted with, uh, with zip ties well, on all, all the drops we've done. And we've been doing this since 1999. We, we put uh, one of these uh, tidbits because I have struggled with this, um, this sampling design to get a good constant uh, temperature profile, temperature regime. And the most reliable has just been this instrument and we i mean we use it all the time like we used it for years so that's but it's not a very fancy mount which is also very nice too it's very simple and easy to use so that's our our system on the back of a commercial scalloper what we do all our work with commercial industry uh likewise the other uh environmental impact survey that my lab's running is the uh ventless trap survey where we're looking at uh, the distribution of lobsters and crab. Uh, and also uh, we, we put a pot in for black sea bass. And so it's a before after control impact design. So the idea is, is that for all these is that you're surveying within the impact area, you're surveying an area similar and hopefully next door to it that's in fact impacted by the same uh, climatic and environmental changes. So once the impact occurs, if you see a difference, that difference is not a result. Uh, if there's a difference between the two areas, the difference is a result of the man-made disturbance, not a result of the areas being different. So uh, you're, you're kind of working under the assumption that nature is always changing, but you want to monitor how much of that change and then the, 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 the amount of change uh, you can siphon off uh, because you have a control. So we've been doing uh, the lobster work, we also at each site, we're doing la larval toes, which we identify the um, lobster larvae, but also uh, the most of the ichthyofauna fish. And we try to keep, we have, have a student that's working on that as well. Uh, here's another close up of that. This is our ichthyofauna net. And then we are setting a trap series. This is the same design that both uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and Maine use uh, to survey their nearshore or uh, lobster populations. And so again, it, it can be linked to those larger databases. And within each one, we have put uh, tidbits and also uh, the hobo data loggers. And so we use those often. This is a, an earlier example from Buzzards Bay of some of the, um, the tidbit uh, data, one of the earlier versions here. And then uh, for the uh, wind farm surveys, we have been uh, putting these, these hobo monitors uh, within it for, for temperature and salinity. Uh, and we, we just put them in the, in the kitchen of the, um, of the uh, uh, lobster pot. And, we, and again, originally we had built a, a kind of a fancy housing for it, but it turned out that it was just as uh, effective and efficient just to zip tie it in there. And as long as you did it on the top, so it wasn't near near the mud or anything, you get a great series of data. And the data looks like this. So conductivity, dissolved oxygen, uh, pH, and temperature. So we are monitoring those for, for each area and uh, our control and our impact uh, so that we'll have a, a, a database of which to start to compare the natural variation. And from those, we can create uh, uh, distribution maps of those particular environmental factors. Um, this is some work funded by the Mass CEC, so it's for the whole Massachusetts wind farm development uh, area here. And um, just an example of how it links up with the lobster um, larvae. And there, here's their distribution from that same survey. So you saw the 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 the, the, the gradient maps of the um, the environment, and, and then you, you can link that up with the number of larvae per thousand meters cubed. And surprising, I mean, if you just take a second and think about this, I mean, we're going out to randomly selected stations and throwing a, a plankton net over and towing it for 10 minutes. And the fact that you are seeing uh, lobster densities there, uh, it, it's really incredible how much, how much 
must be out there. So to look at that a little further now, uh, another component of all this is, um, you know, the fact that what do you, how do you, how do you, how do you examine this data? And so we had a, a my another colleague of mine, Jeff Coles here. Uh, he and his um, master student, uh, he, Jeff's a, 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 a oceanographic modeler, and they took the four stages of larval uh, lobster. So here you have the four stages. The fifth stage, they look just like a little lobster, but they're still swimming in the water column and they're just about to settle. It's about a 30 day process for them to go through these four stages. So here, Jeff has, and his student, uh, Finn Cassidy, they, they put, um, they, they, they populated their oceanographic model with uh, the larvae, looking at where that larvae might drift and settle if they're released here. This is right where the wind farm is going to be developed. It's also where the uh, lobster fishery has moved offshore with warming uh, climate temperature. So you can see that just from this area, this is where these larvae would end up. And part of the, the reason we can do this is we have this uh, amazing model here at SMAS called the FBCOM, run by Dr. Chen and Dr. Dr. Coles. And it's, it's a fantastically powerful oceanographic model that, that encompasses the, uh, actually the entire globe. And then as you get into specific areas, it's a triangulation, they get a higher and higher resolution. And uh, you know, it was used to find um, a black box for the Air, Air um, France uh, crash off Brazil. It was used uh, to look at the nuclear fallout from the tsunami in, in Japan. Uh, it's also used by the Coast Guard. It's been tested by the Coast Guard and is used to forecast icing for mariners. So very powerful, very, uh, it's been uh, quality controlled. The data we get from the, from the tidbits and the hobos, we put uh, directly into that model as part of ground truthing. And I've had uh, students uh, a number of different students on different projects of lobster scallops uh, all use it in the same same way. One of the reasons that's going to be so important for these wind farm development areas is that at least some of them are going to have to develop these converter stations. This is the proposed one for the for the uh, Orsted uh, site um, off Cox's Ledge, and uh, it's supporting 14 turbines, and they will be uh, discharging on average uh, 4 million gallons per day of water that has been uh, uh, is at a temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So uh, a high probably localized effect and that can go up to 8.1. So I think 4 million gallons, I think that's three or four Olympic swimming pools per day. Something something like that. I should have double checked that estimate before the presentation, but I, I it, it's around there. Anyway, it's it, you know, it's something that we do need to monitor and keep, keep track of because that would have uh, an impact, at least locally, on the distribution of these animals. Now to, to move to the, uh, to the community scale, here again, we're back to our, our table with our different uh, objectives that we had divided up into the four pillars of sustainability. And <clears throat> this is kind of an interesting one because the, um, the wind farm companies, of course, they're new and they're developing. They're owned by a number of different companies and they do have problems uh, somewhat uh, communicating and uh, uh, coordinating. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of question about what kind of impact is going to be on a regional level. And that's, that's true over in Europe as well. However, that is the area, the regional level is the area that the fisheries are managed on. And so you've got a great deal of information through the amendment management plans, for example, uh, the final amendment to the Magnuson-Stevenson Act uh, uh, 10, which set up the rotational management in, um, in, in scallops. For these fishery plans, they're required by law to address these national standards. So for the fisheries, you have a quite a bit of data compiled by the, uh, the management councils, in our case, the New England Fisheries Management Council. And so you can look at you know, the, the sustainability structure, the economic output, that information is, is available. And then 
uh, the information that drives those stock assessments and management plans um, in the scallop fishery, uh, they're quite extensive. There are actually three um, groups that really uh, study. So, so with, with scallops, which is kind of unusual, you actually have three independent surveys of the stock. Um, you have the, the traditional uh, toad uh, uh, scallop dredge work that's done by the Virginia Institute of Marine Science and by uh, the Marine Fishery Service. You have a, a HABCAM, which is a towed uh, vehicle with cameras that's run by Kunamasset Farm Foundation and also by uh, the Marine Fishery Service. And then our drop camera survey, which is uh, a, a, um, a, a partnership between the fishing industry and the, and the University of Massachusetts. So here we, what we get with this uh, is, as I, I think I explained a little earlier, but it's another example of it, is a clear shot of the seafloor in which we can count the scallops and measure them. And it's all calibrated. So we're, we have a pixel range of 0.3 um, millimeters. So we're able to get quite a bit of information on, on the, the scallops and the habitat. And that allows us to produce these density maps. And for the uh, management plans, for the assessments, we have to uh, take these numbers and turn them into uh, biomass uh, by area. And you can also do the same thing with the proposed wind farm plans. So in this example, the last time we uh, completely uh, surveyed all the wind farm area was in 2012, uh, which is a while ago. And we have been trying to, to, to redo this, but so far I've been unable to secure the funds. But in this example, you can see the distribution of, of sea scallops. Any red dot on this map is a commercially harvestable density. And so you can use it to calculate the, the area, uh, the total area survey, the area of the wind farm, the percentage that's encompassed by the areas that are going to be leased, the amount of biomass, scallop biomass in there, and the amount of exploitable biomass. So that gives you a, a kind of a concrete estimate. Now, if these are closed areas, that means that that'll be removed. And that's, that's substantial when you think that the fisheries the, the, the harvest of the sea scallop is roughly 20% of what's on the sea floor. So here in the mid-Atlantic, you would be closing uh, uh, as much as 14 or 15% of the um, exploitable biomass in that area. But um, there's also uh, effects on the distribution. We do not, in most of our fisheries, we do not know very well the relationship between the spawning stock and the recruitment. So we're not sure how many animals uh, are required to produce the next generation. And we're not exactly sure how, how, how many or where they are, where they have to be. And it is related because there, all these most of these animals have a larval phase. So there is a, a time where they are at the, uh, somewhat at the, the whim of the current. So here we turn back to our, our, our uh, FDCon model. And this was, uh, I believe, funded by BOEM and now is being continued through the Scallop Research Set-Aside Program, where Dr. Chen is looking at the distribution of currents uh, in wind farm areas presently, and then uh, artificially or so simulating uh, placing a current or a turbine in there and looking at in this example, it's the laminar flow of the kind of vortex that we created. And the first thing he had to do was increase the resolution of this from this was beforehand, and then they had to increase it to, to a, a scale of meters to really get that kind of fine scale information that you need. But um, what you see here is, so he took our, we, we gave him, we, oh, we worked together, but we gave him the distribution of adult scallops, similar to that lobster example, and we distributed so where the larvae might be produced uh, on our continental shelf, where the larvae might be expected to drift in, in, in an average uh, uh, year, in an av they spawn in the fall, so in the fall, and where, how that distribution would change once you add in the wind farms. And in this example, you get kind of a piling around the edge of the vineyard wind area. Now, that was just the first step. Uh, Dr. Chen is, is um, continuing that work where now he's populated a field 
and instead of just a straight flow, he's added uh, the tides and the vortex uh, currents of uh, associated with each one. And so it's about three minutes, but I'll just pop it through quickly so that you can see um, how this, this model works per turbine. So this is the next phase, and he's continuing uh, work on it. But it's quite, it's quite spiffy, I think. And then you can see for the individual turbine. So uh, once we get to the point where we're adding the the environmental information that we've been collecting um, from each of these surveys uh, with your instruments, and then also. Um, the larval information and linking it up with the distribution information, it could be uh, quite a powerful simulation to help us understand how this is going to uh, change over the next 20 years. Finally, uh, I do want to point out that that although you know there are man-made barriers or borders between states, borders between countries, the marine environment, uh, the fish, and certainly do not recognize that, that at all. And so here's an example of a project that I, I worked on as a, a graduate student back in the 80s with my, my master supervisor, Dr. Mike Adswell. And at that time, they were going to block off uh, this area for tidal power turbines. They were going to create, this is about five kilometers, and they were going to put a, a barrier across here. Um, and there were a whole series of oceanographic models looking at the, uh, the effect, but also uh, we were wondering, this is the highest tides in the world, and, and originally, because it was quite muddy, they thought there weren't many fish there, but, but Mike Dadswell disagreed and had talked to the fishermen. We worked uh, for a series of years, um, five years or so, on tagging uh, the American shad, uh, the founding fish. So, so we tagged about 13, um, 13,500 fish up in these two bays in Cobequid and Minas Basin. And we get returns from every river from Florida all the way up to Labrador. So that means that fish that spawn in each of these rivers, these are like salmon or like uh, uh, alewives, they, they return to the rivers to spawn, and then they, they, they live in the, in the ocean for their adult life and, and keep returning each year to spawn. So, so that means that fish from each one of these rivers were all up here in the, in the Minas Basin uh, feeding in the summertime. So how did they do that? How did they migrate up and down the coast? Uh, one thought is that it's an electromagnetic, electromagnetic field that there is affected by their lateral line. And so we don't understand, if, if, we're, if we're developing these offshore wind farms, we're running energy uh, through the power cables, it is creating electromagnetic field. How much of it would it be enough to overcome the, the uh, electromagnetic field of the earth and therefore affect migrations of, for example, this fish? But AOIs also do do this. The sharks and the um, and the striped bass follow this. And then, of course, you have the larger oceanographic migrations of the bluefin tuna, swordfish, and other other things. So, I I hope that I've kind of um, I know I, I've I, I, I've I've talked pretty much nonstop and and uh, thrown a lot at you. But I hope that this serves as somewhat of a framework to start to think about how we look at these different questions and categorize these things. Again, we're turning to the, the two inspirations for this. And I, I uh, originally thought of it in a cube design in which you'd fill in using those tables, you'd fill in each of the cubes with this type of information. For me, it, it's an easy, easy visual and I kind of think visually, although I have to admit that the editors of the journal I just published this in did, did not agree. And so I had to cut this figure out of it. But it was based on, on again, Ernest Mayer's uh, idea of, of uh, scale and how, and, and, and how you look at it, and also Dr. Uh, Rob Stevenson's work with uh, the Canadian Research Network. And uh, yeah, I think, it, uh, I think it could help if it's, uh, if it's implemented, or at least it gets people 
thinking along that direction. So it's going to be a, an amazingly dynamic uh, next few years. And um, if you're interested in the paper, here's the reference here. Um, it's uh, it's open access, so you can just go to the IC's Journal of Marine Science. It's in the Food for Thought, and uh, you can you can basically uh, read the a lot of the information that I've just uh, uh, told you. Um, and I hope that you find it of use. I'd be very glad to try and answer any questions. I guess I'm just a, a minute or two uh shy so i hope i hope that works just just fine thank you very much and i'm not exactly sure what to do next so <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it to the presenters here maybe i'll escape out of my presentation mode.